Good morning, everyone. This is Larry Williams back again. It is a beautiful day here in the United States Virgin Islands. Butterflies outside. I've talked to people in Chicago and Montana and Michigan today. No butterflies there. Lots of snow. A lot of stuff to talk about in the market today. I want to begin, as we do every week, with looking at some of the unknown great growth stocks. We pointed out some of these phenomenal stocks that really should be in your portfolios if you're a longer term stock investor. And they can also be pretty darn goody trading vehicles as well. How about holler for the dollar? Look at this performance of the stock. Oh my gosh, another one of these stocks that just can't seem to go down. It's Dollar General, holler for the dollar. You know, the company you really don't think much of as being a highly successful, profitable company until you look at the price of the stock. Uh, they do $22 billion in the sales. This is not a little company. You drive by these stores, you're like, what is that back there? Price sales ratio is pretty good at 1.57. PE ratio is not bad at 22. Big thing, big, big thing. I don't like companies that have debt. Their debt to equity ratio, 0.38. And they do pay a dividend, 1.28. That's okay. The big success of this business really comes from their gross operating margins. At 30% gross operating margins, uh, there's money in this business. They've done really well. Uh, in terms of prices, they beat or came close to Walmart in many cases when consumers report that a study. So they are uh, shopper friendly. They're adding better known brands. They're, not, they're doing what Costco has done too, is having good quality brands and dead bargain prices. Because of that, they're attracting upscale shoppers now. It isn't just uh, low income shoppers going to dollar sales. Uh, they're growing group of customers earn $70,000 a year or more. So these are not just uh, people off the streets buying a Dollar General. Dollar General has really found a place for themselves in the marketplace. And that accounts for some phenomenal growth that we've seen in that stock. So if we look at it technically on a shorter term basis, I always like to do that. We can see the seasonal pattern right here right now is for the market to start to rally until into next year. Typically, it's come down about here. Uh, in June, July, August, and then it starts at October rally. So we're in a point to look for buying. In terms of professionals, the professionals who are heavy buyers back here and over here, back here, they're not quite in the buy zone yet, a little bit more of a dip in here, and uh, they will be in the buy zone. So you want to look for that in Dollar General. I did a cycle forecast. It's pretty interesting. It's pretty cyclical stock. We're coming into the area of a cyclical low about the first week of November over here. The stock should expect to rally until the end of the year. You can see it's had a pretty decent cycle it's about every three months as we see lows in this market. So that's our update version on the dollar. Uh, we talked last week about beware of the bears. The market's down today and the bears are going to come out of their caverns again. I want to show you the importance of not becoming too bearish too often. It's really huge because inside all of us, uh, there is a cognitive bearish bias to like negative bad news. That's why newspapers always print the bad news. They never print the good news on the front page. Because we all fall into this, listening to the bears, we can get in a lot of trouble. Uh, right now, this is an interesting uh, point in common. I Google bull market now. 26 million people are looking, oh, maybe there's a bull market now. Google bear market now, 62 million. In other words, it's three times as much interest in a bear market as there is a bull market. And this is going to be true in a bull market or a bear market. There's a predominant fear. That's what drives traders, a great fear about markets. And it's this fear that the the, um, the doomsdayers will play on with us and get us much more interested in the bear side than the bull side. And there are perpetual bears out there. <clears throat> Some of them are friends of mine. Uh, some of them I've known, <clears throat> but there are Mark Faber, Dave Stockman, who worked for the Reagans, uh, T.J. Holt. I asked T.J. one time, why is he always bearish? She said, well, it's easier to sell subscription to a newsletter. Most all the conservative media sites, and I'm probably as conservative as anybody you'll meet, but the conservative media sites tend to pander to purveyors of pessimism. Why? I don't know, but they do. So the Ron Pauls, all these people <clears throat> are bearish and on and on. They're perpetually wrong. But they lure us in. My favorite was Vern Myers, who turned bearish in 1947. He's no longer with us now, but he was a Canadian guy. He was really bearish on everything. And he was such a good writer, I had to take his newsletter out in the sunshine and read it because it just scared me to death. 
So these people like Harry Schultz, another good example, Vernon Myers, perpetual bears, you have to really be careful of being perpetually bearish in the market because the trend is up. <clears throat> Here's the trend going back to the 1500s. Yeah, there's been some declines in there. But on a longer term basis, the trend is to the upside. You just think about it. Since 2009, we've been in a bull market 10 years. So that's 2,250 trading days, roughly. Only one of those days would ever be the top, the end of the bull market, the start of a bear market. Only one. So you're, somebody's chances of calling the bear market are about one out of 2,225. A quite difficult and arduous task to perform. So keep calm. Beware of the bears. I, I'm, I'm not a perpetual bull. I love to sell short. I made my first million dollars selling short in 1970. So I'll sell short when it's time. But I've learned you have to be really careful. You have to be a judicious bear. You just can't sell anytime, any place. Hey, it's contest time. You know, each and every week we have a contest here, a little trivia question about the markets. The winner will give a free two-month subscription to my uh, market commentaries at iReadyTrade.com. We call it Larry TV, where every week I point out trade, show what I'm doing in the markets, etc. So the first person to type in the correct answer in the question box will win. So and get ready. Here's a question, and it is, when did the first modern stock mutual fund begin in America? Kind of an interesting point of when this fund began. We'll answer the question for you in a moment. Hopefully somebody will know the answer, can type in the name if you want to, but the date of the first modern stock mutual fund. We really had mutual funds and the stocks way back in the 1600s, but in terms of America, it really all began in a specific year. Well, mutual funds are gonna make you the money. I wanna show you how the money is made in the market. I'd like to talk about that today before we go on to specific trades. The first rule of making money, and this is so critical, is the trend is the basis of all profits. That is just essential to understanding how to make money in the market. If you don't get that, you're going to be in a world of hurt. It's just this simple. No trend, no profit. Now, we all agree with that, but we haven't thought this statement through. Uh, obviously, if there's no change in price, nobody can make any money. So trend is critical the identification of trend is what it's all about so here's the big question what causes or what allows trends to develop ever thought about that what allows trends is really significant once you understand that it'll change your trading perspective so where the money is is where trends are we have to be able to understand the basis of trends and all trends are really a function of time. The more time, the more trend that may develop. Now, this may sound like a simple statement, but it's very important to understand being a trader. Think about this again now. The more time, the more trend can develop. Obviously, if you're trading for three days, you can't catch as big of a move as somebody who's trading for 10 years, can you? That shows the validity of trend. In fact, this is a really interesting fact that came from a study of Fidelity Mutual Fund and their brokers from our customers. They did a study to see who were making and who were losing money at their firm. And they found the shorter you hold a stock, the more likely you are to lose money. Time again is your ally, it's your friend. <clears throat> the most interesting one is the accounts that have done the best of all the accounts of Fidelity were the accounts of people who forgot they had an account. <sighs> They woke up one day and said, oh, yeah, I got that account. I forgot about that. Time had been their great friend, and their stocks had performed quite well. It really shows clearly the importance of trend. And this gets to, the, to what I call the day trader dilemma. 99% of day traders and most short-term traders fail. Not because they're dumb, not because the markets are wild or volatile, not because of Democrats or Republicans, liberals or conservatives. It's because time is against them. They have just a very few hours to capture a trend, and that's really difficult. Trend is seemingly not their friend. Trend's not on their side. That's the reason why short-term trading, and we see that from the study at Fidelity. The shorter you hold the stock, the more likely you are to lose money. And that's because time is against you. Day traders have just a very few hours. 
four or five hours, that's it, to try to make some money. <clears throat> and this gets back to something that's really critical. I'm going to talk more about this in the coming week. But to make a lot of money day trading, since you don't have much time for trend, right? You have to have a big position. If I want to make $10,000 in a day day trading, I'm probably going to have to have uh, maybe a five lot in the S&P or a 10 lot. Hoping I get one trade for $1,000. Okay, good. Almost. The problem, though, is when the losses come, <clears throat> my loss will probably be bigger than my gains. So since I have a large position on, I'm going to get hurt a lot. And day traders tend to let their profits run away from them. So to make a lot of money, you have to have a large position on. As you have that large position on, when you get tagged, oh boy, do you get tagged. It really hurts. So that's what you have to be careful of as a day trader. I'm going to talk more next week about how you can turn this to your advantage as a trader to maximize uh, profit potential using time as your ally. Oh, contest time. Rachel, do we have a winner for the contest? We do. Um, but I just want to clarify first. We have two answers that hit 1928. One of them is Vanguard Wellington in 1928, and the other one is just 1928. So I'm not sure. Well, 1928 is the winning question, uh, winning answer. And it was Massachusetts Investors Trust, which later merged into the Wellington Fund. So um, whoever came first, I guess, uh, gets the prize. And if it was a tie, what the heck? We'll give them both the free subscription. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, Tony and Ellis. I will collect your personal, your email information after the show. And we have another uh, uh, contest coming up with a really interesting question about a guy who I've admired a lot over the years. So stay tuned. We have another opportunity to uh, win a contest. I want to talk a little bit about the future, especially in the stock market, and go over some trades that I think are coming up right here, right now. We talked last week about the market going to new highs. We've been doing that for a couple of weeks here, pointing out the advanced decline line has gone to new highs, suggesting the stock price would go to new highs. We also showed my accumulation work combining price, open interest, and volume, which said price should go to a new high. And uh, our cycle forecast, let's say we should start to rally about October 28th and see a nice year-end rally. A lot of bullish stuff going on there, right? And uh, this is where we are. We've made new highs. Now we're down today. I'm going to show you some stuff on what's going to happen in a moment. But clearly, the new highs have been reached. Uh, we've broken out to the upside, and there's more to come. The advanced decline line continues to be incredibly strong in here. Here's an easy short-term trade for you. In the last 21 years, a long time period, the S&P 500 have rallied 95% of the time the first two trading days in November. That begins tomorrow and on Monday. Those have been really bullish trading opportunities. So there's a short-term trading opportunity. We've seen some weakness in the market. And here is my 15-minute cycle forecast. You can see what I'm suggesting should happen. The market has dipped down as it should, but it's starting to come into a buy point around 14 o'clock. And then starting on Monday, it looks like we move back to the upside. Those are very short-term cycle forecasts using interday market action. You can see what I think it's going to happen. We're going to move right back to the upside here. And the big numbers behind this is that in the last 21 years, 95% of the time, the S&Ps have had strong rallies the first two trading days of November. So there's a good trade for you for the first half of the show. I'll come back in a little bit. We're going to have a couple more trades like this and more real-time trading from Larry Williams. So we'll take a break now and see you shortly. Welcome back. Just to review again, that short-term trade in the S&P E-minis, uh, 95% of the time in the last 21 years, we've seen strength the first two trading days of November. We've actually seen a lot of strength in November. I'll have more about that in the coming weeks as well. There's some phenomenal trades, trades in the stock, individual stocks have been correct 38 years in a row. I'll be talking about those the trades later on in November. There's our 15-minute cycle forecast. And next week, I'm going to spill the beans on moving averages. I saw some people on YouTube this week talking about moving averages and how to make a lot of money in moving average. So if you use moving averages, have thought about moving averages, you cannot miss next week's show. I'm going to show you the truth of moving averages and making money in the stock and commodity market. Okay, potential trades. Let's take a look. We're a follow-up on the Swiss franc. You know, we were talking about 
getting along that market. We showed this back in a couple of weeks ago. Our intermarket forecast suggested the Swiss franc should start to rally. Uh, commercials were buying the Swiss franc. Typically, when the commercials, that's the users and producers, in this case, banks and governments, are buying, those markets tend to rally. And our cycle forecast. So that's what I think sets me apart from other people the way I look at the market. I don't just look at a chart and say, oh, there's a trend line here. I believe conditions move the markets. Charts don't move the markets. So I like to look at these conditions. Then I can get into the trade. This is back here when we got long the trade. You saw it here a couple of weeks ago. Well, now the market's had a pullback. Here's my stop. Here's my target. So this trade is in play. There's nothing to do. I'll need to be stopped out with a nominal loss or get a pretty nice target in the trade. So that's our follow-up on the Swiss franc. Gold, well, this has been a really popular item this year because gold's had a rip-roaring market. We were able to forecast in our 2019 forecast report a bull market, that was the headline, bull market for gold. That certainly happened, but now we have some trouble. Let me show you what I think the trouble is. First of all, this purplish line up here is total open interest. And when open interest is very high on a relative basis, we have always been at top in the market. High open interest tells us a lot of interest. Everybody is interested in the market. And it doesn't matter if it's gold or potato chips. When everybody's interested, the trend's probably over. We can back that up, though, by looking at the players in the marketplace. If you're not aware of it, every Thursday, the United States government releases the positions held by the small speculators. That's this green line. Those are the little guys. They're usually wrong. This is the most bullish that they've been since, well, right here at the major market high. Of course, when they're extremely bearish down here, it was a major market low. So they tend to do the wrong thing most of the time. The commercials are the smart money. That's the red. Those are the users and producers, the people that mine gold, use gold, the jewelers, the computer chip makers. They are very bearish. They're as bearish even more than they were back here. And of course, the peak up here, they were also very bearish compared to where they had been in prior time periods. So point is, we have the high open, highest open interest ever, and the public is wildly bullish. The largest users produces the largest short position they've ever had. Here's my question. Who will win, the professionals or the public? I'll let you think about that. There's my price forecast for gold on a short-term basis. As mentioned last week, I'm looking for gold to rally. But on a longer term basis, which is the bigger term trade, right? So short term trade, yeah, we talked about this triangle and getting above the triangle and breakout and watch October 31st where these two vector points met, meet. And gold has started to rally. I think we're going to see gold rally back into these old high areas that we saw back here. And then the projection is clearly to the downside. So short term rally in gold, absolutely. We talked about that last week. Market's moving good to the upside in here, but don't stay with this too long because we're going to be looking for a sell signal in not too many days in gold, probably maybe seven, eight days from now, something like that. So rally against the downtrend is a trading opportunity that I see now in gold. In the last 17 years, gold has rallied 85% of the time in the first three trading days of November. This is something I do on my I really trade uh, Larry TV weekly commentary. We show the trading day of the month, the concept I came up with years ago. There are some very specific, strong trading days each month for gold, bonds, S&Ps, crude oil. We go over there uh, on my uh, weekly report so we know where the really seasonal sweet spots are for gold. And the first couple of days of November have been very strong for gold. So short-term rally is what we've been talking about. Here's the one I want to sell short when it's time to sell short silver because silver uh, is the same scenario as gold. The public is the most bullish they've ever been in silver. Commercials are very bearish. Open is really high. So we have a setup market here, and it has not rallied as strongly as gold. That's the point. If you're going to get in a fight, you want to fight with the weakest guy in the group, not the strongest guy. If I want to sell short, I want to sell short in a family like gold and silver, the one that's been the weakest. The one that's been the weakest is silver. So when the selling opportunity comes, expect it to be in silver. It's been weaker. Remember, gold was way back over here, and silver is a lot weaker, and it's overvalued. 
I love my overvaluation index. We can value when silver is overvalued. You can see these zones I've marked and when it's been overvalued. And most all of the time we start to come down and we are currently overvalued, which tells us not only is this technically starting to get weak, it is in an overvalued zone. So commercials, users and producers will say, uh oh, there's no value in silver now and they will start to sell this market. Okay, we're going to do another contest time, so get ready. Uh, here comes another really interesting question. And the question is, who is known as the original gold bug? This guy turned bullish on gold years and years and years ago, and his build as the original gold bug. So we'll see if somebody has an answer to that, and I will continue. Bonds have been a lot like gold this year, and I expect bonds rally. We've talked about this, showed this forecast last week. And this is a short-term rally to the upside in the bond market. Uh, but our intermarket forecast work suggests this rallies and lasts until around the end of November, and then we come back to the downside. This model forecasts the direction of what should happen to gold. I'm sorry, what should happen to bonds. It's a fundamental relationship in the marketplace, not cyclical, not technical. The fundamentals suggest we should start to rally up to here, come down here, and we see around the 1st of December, there should be a really nice selling opportunity in the bond market. The cycle forecasts that I use, by the way, are done using timing solution software. I have no involvement with the, don't get paid anything from them or anything. I just use the software and people keep asking, how do you create that at timingsolution.com. Crude oil is getting set up, I think, for a buy signal. Um, a couple of interesting things have gone on. If we look at our valuation model, when crude is undervalued, it was undervalued here, undervalued over here. It's been in the undervalued zone. The last time was overvalued was here, and we're not overvalued. If we look at the commercials, that's the red line. They've actually been accumulating while price has been flat in here. They've been buying. I think that's a positive development for crude oil. What I don't like is my fundamental forecasting model says, yeah, we can rally in here, but not a great big rally. But I do think we can look for some buying opportunities in crude oil. In fact, I have orders working in the market myself. Where work to be a buyer? Well, one idea would be a trend line break, getting above the highest high of the last eight days. That's been a pretty good channel technique in crude oil. A nice big trend line coming down here. That would be a channel opportunity so if we can get above the big trend line to the downside. My percent R, you can see in the black line, I think most people know about that, is in the oversold uh, area, which means we can expect a rally in this market. Typically, when we're oversold, we get rallies. So I think we're getting a culmination of things here that tell us we can be looking for an opportunity in crude oil on the long side. Okay, contest time. Ooh, let's see. Rachel, do we have a winner? Yeah, we do. All uh, right. We've got a winner, winner, winner. Who's sure, the winner? Actually, lots of people had the correct answer. But oh, lots of people this time. New James Dines turned bullish in 1950 on gold. If you ever get a chance to hear Jim, he is a great presenter, a, a, a real uh, a, uh, widely uh, read uh, Renaissance man, a great guy. You'll enjoy meeting him a great deal. So who's our first winner, Rachel? Fred. Fred. Yes. Okay. Fred. Well, Fred, Rachel will get your contacts and we will give you uh, – and I was wondering if anybody would recognize and, and get them. So I'm glad a lot of people did, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh. Um, I also want to say, Mark S., your answer made me like, laugh. <laughs> His answer was King Tut. King Tut. <laughs> oh, that may have been the first gold bug. No, but we got to give credit to Jim Dines. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go to listen to Jim, uh, he's uh, uh, quite a guy. Uh, a lot of life experiences that he shares and very much a Renaissance man. And he was the original gold bug, Jim Dines. Okay, another trading opportunity I'm seeing coming up here is the British pound. Uh, cycle forecast, say we should start to see this market move down a little bit more precipitously, maybe around the middle of November. We're starting to rally up here. If this starts to fail, we could see it move back to the downside. Maybe there won't be a Brexit. Who knows? If we look at the valuation model, we see it has moved into the overvalued zone as it was overvalued back here and overvalued over here. Uh, commercials are not really set up in this market. Uh, public has been buying, but not they're not crazy bullish yet. 
The seasonal pattern, though, the blue line is to the downside. So we have an overvalued market with the seasonal tendency. Usually this time of the year we go down. So I want to be looking at the British pound. Entry ideas, well, you could use the lowest low of the last six days. That's been a good channel for the British pound. Uh, or making a lower short-term high. That's also been a pretty good place uh, to see the British pound so short. Well, we're not drinking any hot chocolate here in the Virgin Islands, but I know you people in cold weather country are. Uh, my home state of Montana, I saw they had roads closed this week, so there's probably some cocoa, and there's probably more than marshmallows in that hot chocolate too up there. So we talked about uh, cocoa being set up as a cell. I want to do a follow-up on that. The reasons why, again, I do things for reasons when I trade, right? The commercials were selling the market. They'd been buying over here, selling here. They were selling back here. So if the commercials set this market up, and our cycles say the market should move to the downside. That's a setup we looked at a couple of weeks ago. And this is a follow-up on cocoa. It's finally started to break down here. Um, it's finally started to move. We see accumulation is coming, uh, not coming into the market. This big area up here to me looks like an area of distribution, which would sharp, uh, could cause a precipitous decline in cocoa. Protective stops would be above uh, this day's high. Uh, we shouldn't take that day's high out, the highest high yesterday. Other than that, I expect cocoa to continue moving to the downside. Corn and the grains we talked about also, about the same basic reason here, commercials short grain. Short over here, short over here. Usually when they get short, corn comes down. And our corn cycle also suggested about the same thing. We pointed out a week or so ago, corn was, at, corn was under distribution, made a higher high in price, not an accumulation. And this is what's happened. Corn from when we first pull, uh, talked about it being a short sale has come down. The accumulation has really fallen apart. Now look at this, we're way down here while price is still up here. Seasonal patterns also now to the downside. So I want to stay with this short position, stop highest high of the last six or seven days, something like that. I think there's still more to the downside in this market, and you definitely want to be that way with it. It's still under distribution. Look at this selling that's been coming in. So um, that's another market you continue to work in that direction. I like what uh, I hope you like what you've seen today, and that you'd like to learn come to trade with me. Because what's different, I think, is the way I look at these markets. That I look at several things. I look at the cycles. I look at the commercials. The commitment to trader report. I look at accumulation distribution coming into the market. And you don't have to do this with me, but my point is that you can do this with yourself, that you should use your charts for specific purposes, that you think about markets being conditional, being set up. That's going to make you a heck of a lot better trader than just trading off some whirly gig indicator on a chart. I hope you learned a lot this week. We presented out a couple of trades for you, the gold trade strength, the strength in the S&P E-minis coming in here in November and the potential short sales coming up in the future. So next week I'll be back. I'm going to spill the beans on moving averages and have more trades for you. Until next week, this is Larry Williams wishing you good luck and good trading.